Well, speaking of polls, why don't we step away from politics briefly and let's talk a little history and patriotism, things like that. After all, Independence Day is upon us. Poll just came out saying only 41% of Americans are extremely proud to be an American. And don't ignore that. Look, all politics, everything else aside, that's a really big deal. Patriotism is one of the essential elements of a society, of any society. If you have people who want to be there and feel blessed to be there, your society in general will prosper. And if they don't feel like that, you're probably in a bit of trouble. Anyway, we'll talk about that in some sweet World War II history. I'm about to nerd out on some naval stuff with Nathan Canistero. He is the author of the book, uh, the Mighty Moo. Why do I keep screwing up the Mighty Moo? I keep wanting to call it the Mighty Cowpen, but that's the name of the ship. Anyway, Nathan, before we get to the ship, the Navy, that wonderful carrier that was uh, a warrior for this country and the great men who served on it, patriotism. What, what happened between the 1940s and now? And I know that's a very long, complicated answer. You don't have to take up two hours to give it, but... I don't like it that people don't love it here. I love it here. I mean, I, I do too. I'm, I'm sort of an old fashioned traditional patriot. I, I, you know, if you ask a hundred people that question, you'd probably get a hundred different answers. But what worries me is that politics and patriotism have gotten entangled a little bit. And there's, a, there's people in this country sometimes have a misconception that you can't be patriotic unless you're a hundred percent in approval of everything the government is and is doing and who's in charge. And, and it, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, you know, you can honor our country and the values and ideals that it stands for without necessarily being being partisan. And uh, I think it's kind of like a marriage contract in that way. You're in it for the, the good times and the bad. And, and honestly, when things are going worse, that's probably when you need to be the most patriotic because that's when your country needs you the most. Yeah, no doubt about it. Okay, you know what? We're done with politics. I want to talk about some <laughs> World War II history. I just nerd out on this stuff. What in the world is the Mighty Moo? Most people have never even heard of it. Well, yeah, it was a light aircraft carrier. And, you know, if, when you're thinking about a World War II aircraft carrier, this is not that ship. Uh, you think about the Intrepid or the Lexington or the Yorktown, the, the big ships that are in museums today. But uh, the, the Cowpens was one of nine light aircraft carriers that the Navy made be between uh, 42, 43, essentially they had a gap. They were losing carriers faster than they could build them. And so they, they cranked together nine of these sort of mid-sized ships. They, they put a flat top on a light carrier or light cruiser in order to, uh, to make them work, just sort of, they were a desperate stopgap measure uh, until the big carriers started arriving on the scene in uh, mid-43, uh, late 40, uh, late of that year, yeah. Nathan, you call them light carriers for those who aren't naval historians. They might be confused what that means. It's more than just lighter, isn't it? Why? What makes a light carrier versus a big boy carrier? Well, they're small. These were not pretty ships. Let's let's be honest here. They're about two thirds <laughs> of the length of a, of, of a of an actual aircraft carrier. They only carried thirty three planes. Uh, they had a very narrow flight deck, about 73 feet. That seems like really a really big space, but if you're landing a plane with a, a 42 or 54-foot uh, or wingspan on it, that you're, you're really sort of threading the needle. Um, they're, uh, they're kind of a bootleg carrier. You know, the, the hull was never intended to be an aircraft carrier at all, uh, and so they were cramped, they were dangerous, they were unstable in high seas. Uh, they were kind of a mess for a lot of different reasons. And the only reason that the Navy wanted them at all is because the big carriers kept getting sunk. I mean, if you think about it, we started the war with six aircraft carriers and by the end of 42, we were down to two. Um, I think a lot of Americans forget how badly the, that first year of the war was going. I, I can't even imagine the political firestorm in this country if we went to war and lost two thirds of our aircraft carriers in a year. Um, so it's it's a mark of the Navy sort of desperation that they they you know they take these very inferior ships with so many problems and send them out in, into battle. Uh, tell us about the crew of these boats. Was it the creme de la creme? Who did they drag onto these light carriers that tip over in the open ocean? 
Well, you know, the Navy was going from something like 130,000 people to several million uh, in the space of about two years there. So the vast bulk of people who were assigned aboard this ship were reservists. These are folks that had, most of them had joined the Navy voluntarily to avoid being drafted into the Army. Uh, and so none of them had any seagoing uh, experience, very, very few. There were only a handful of men aboard the Cowpens that were sort of what we might consider professional Navy and that they were Naval Academy grads. But these were, you know, talk about patriotism. This was a sample of America, big cities, small towns, farm boys, factory workers, people from all walks of life, all different regions. And, you know, and they sort of thrown into this war together. Um, you just talk about even the pilots, uh, the Cowpens' greatest fighter ace was a former insurance agent from Indianapolis. <laughs> uh, one, of, one of her former captains uh, w- worked his way up from the enlisted ranks, and he never did, graduated from college at all. He was studying mining engineering and, at uh, UCAL. Uh, you know, they were they were just kind of this crazy of uh, mix of or sampling of America. And to include my grandfather, who served aboard, he was a 22 year old. A uh, man from upstate New York, he was a carpenter, never been outside of his hometown, uh, you know, and to be suddenly thrown in this little tiny ship in a great big war was it was a heck of a shock for him. Why do men like your grandpa, what what drove them? It's, it's one of the things I just find so endlessly fascinating as I was reading your book. Thank you for sending me that, by the way. My pleasure. And all the World War II books I read, I... I I, I'm just blown away by the men and what drove them. And they were such fighters. They weren't just trying to get by. They weren't there for three hots and a cot. They wanted to take it to the enemy. What what was it about those men? Well, there's kind of a mix of things. The pilots were certainly that way. You know, if you were a pilot in World War II, it's an entirely volunteer um, volunteer profession. Casualty rates were high. The first squadron aboard the Cowpens had a 40% casualty rate uh, by the time they came home after that first year. Uh, so, you know, these were guys who wanted to take it to the Japanese for what they, they did to us at Pearl Harbor. Um, if you talk to the individual crewmen, some of them would, would say, well, I wanted to serve, but I, I, you know, my, my dad or my grandfather or my uncle told me what World War I was like in the trenches, and I'd rather be aboard a, a Navy ship. You know, you take your meals with you. Um, my grandfather felt a little bit of that, but we also had a, a Navy connection in our family. We're three generations Navy all the way back to World War I. Great grandpa earned the Navy Cross on convoy duty in the Atlantic. So, for him to you know follow his dad's footsteps and join the Navy seemed to be a logical thing to do. And I mean, his sons went on to join the Navy uh, in in Vietnam. So, you know, it was uh, it was a family tradition, and and he he wanted to wanted to follow up on it. How about that? The book is the Mighty Moo. I encourage everybody to go pick it up. You will find it. Endlessly fascinating. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for joining us. Highly, highly recommended. Well-written book. Very, very well-written. Interesting.